What do photographers and guitarists both love in common? Tones. And this time we are going to look at the tone curve module. I can't believe it's taken me this long to get to this. Let's do it. Hi, and welcome to episode 53 of Understanding Darktable. The tone curve module. This is almost my Swiss Army Knife module. It's the one that I use almost on every image that I process. You can do similar things with levels control. You can do similar things with some of the color modules. But the tone curve module, for me, is just a great all-round tool. So... For this particular video, I decided to pull up this old image of Nat, a male model I've shot with a couple of times around Sydney. And what we need to understand about the tone curve module is that across the horizontal axis, or our x-axis, is a representation of our tonal values at the input stage. In other words, before anything has been done. The vertical scale, or our y-axis, represents the tonal values after the tone module has done its job. When this white line is on a 45 degree angle from bottom left to top right, and there are no nodes added to it, then no change is occurring to the image. So if I turn the module on, nothing changes. We can see a histogram in the background of the module, which is pretty much a mirror image of the histogram itself. And if we were to create a node as close to the middle of the graph as we possibly could, just to demonstrate this idea of inputs and outputs, if I was to drag this up, look at the values at the bottom of the graph part of the module. What it's telling us is that the input value that was 50% or 50.6%, so as close to the mid-tone as I could get with my mouse, sadly, there is no option to like enter a text value for this, which is kind of sad. Almost every other module, you can do that right-click thing and get the, the ability to just enter a text value and hit enter, but in the tone curve module, you don't. Uh, and then, after the 50.6, we see a slash and 64.4. So what that's telling us is that after the tone curve module, that mid-tone value has been lifted to a value of 64.4%. And as we can see by the curve, all of the values to either side of that node have been adjusted to some degree so that the anchor points in the bottom left corner and the top right corner remain where they were. So our black point and our white point have not changed. Likewise, if we were to bring this down in value, then what we have done is taken what was our mid-tone value of 50.1%, and we've now remapped it to a value of 29.6% after the module. So that's all well and good, but what are the practical applications of the tone curve module? Well, the most common one is to use it to apply a little bit of contrast to your mid-tones to just create some more dynamic contrast to your entire image. And to do that, we could do something like this, you know, lift our highlights and drop our shadows, and we've immediately created a little bit more drama and contrast to the image. But there's so much more to this module than just that. So let's double click to reset the graph. And let's look at the color space. You'll see from this menu that there are four different options covering three different color spaces. We've got lab linked channels. We've got lab independent channels. We've got XYZ linked channels and we've got RGB linked channels. And RGB linked channels is the default color space. Now, with all of the three options which use linked channels, what it means is that the luminosity 
is being affected by anything you do with this curve. Now, you will notice that there appears to be some change to the saturation when you alter the tone curve, depending on the color space that you're working in. And that kind of is the case. It's a little bit outside my wheelhouse uh, to explain it further than that. But the exception to that is the lab independent channels mode. Now, lab, as we've discussed before, is lightness plus the A channel and the B channel. So in the lab color space, L is lightness and merely refers to the luminosity of any given pixel. The A channel is our green and magenta tint slider, if you like, and the B channel is our blue and yellow tint slider, color adjustment, call it what you will. So when we choose the lab independent channels color space in the tone curve module, we will get access to these three buttons in the top left. So L for lightness, A for green magenta, and B for blue yellow. And it means that we can apply a curve in the A and B channels to affect the color without affecting the luminosity. Or we can work in the L channel and affect the luminosity without affecting the color. So if we did our contrast curve in the L channel, we can see that we've applied contrast to the lightness values, but we haven't introduced any color shift. Let's just double click to reset that. If I was to go to the A channel, again, I scratch my head at the way the color swatch is displayed in the background of this module. Now, there might be some technical reason for this that I don't understand, but it seems to me that if we move the curve to the upper left-hand side of the whole graph, we are introducing magenta, and if we move the curve to the bottom right-hand side, we are introducing green. So it kind of makes me wonder, why is the saturated green in the bottom left and not in the bottom right corner? And likewise, why is the magenta swatch up in the top right corner when, to my mind, it should be in the top left corner? Again, like I said, there might be some technical reason for why it is that way. It just seems odd to me. Because someone queried me on something I did in one of the last couple of videos where I was talking about tone curve and as I was preparing to do this video, it made me think, yeah, this is kind of related to that. So any move that we do to the top left-hand side of the graph is going to affect the magenta tones in the image. But if we do what I've done here, we are only affecting the brightest luminosities and we are adding magenta. If I did that, I am adding green to only the brightest luminosities. And we can see it in his skin tone. We've introduced green. He almost looks like the Hulk. If I was to put that back where it was and do the same thing down here, we can introduce green into the shadow areas of the image, or we can introduce magenta into the shadowed parts of the image. And the same thing goes for the B channel. Again, I feel like the blue color swatch should be in the bottom right hand corner and the yellow should be in the top left hand corner because same thing applies. We move it to the top left, we get yellow, move it to the bottom right, we get blue. So not sure. But same deal applies. We can add blue to our shadows. We can add yellow to our shadows. Or we can add yellow to our highlights. Or we can add blue to our highlights. Now, there might be a really scientific way to use the lab independent channels mode. Or it might just be you muck around with it as you see fit. If you have an image where 
there is a particular color cast that you need to correct, then you could do it with the lab independent channels mode. But as you've seen, three quarters of this module works in color spaces that use a linked channels mode. Okay, so we will reset the module. And as you can see, we are now back to our RGB linked channels color space. All right, next up, we've got the interpolation method. And you will see from the drop down that there are three options, cubic, centripetal, and monotonic. And monotonic is the default value. If we mouse over that, you can read the help there. Cubic spline is better for producing smooth curves, but oscillates when nodes are too close. Centripetal is better for avoiding cusps and oscillations with close nodes, but it's less smooth, whatever that means. And monotonic is better for accuracy of pure analytical functions like log, gamma, exponential, and so forth. So the cubic spline will allow nodes to be very close together and create very extreme results like this, which 99.9% .9 of the time is probably not what you were after. If we right click and get rid of one of those nodes and we now jump to centripetal, you'll notice that that type of curve can't be achieved, right? With the cubic mode, we ended up with a straight line that was almost vertical here. With centripetal, if we drag this node to a point where its X value exceeds the value of this other node, then this second node will simply disappear like so. And then we've got the monotonic spline. Now I can't explain what the monotonic spline does that's different from the other two. All I can tell you is it's the default behavior. All right, moving on, we have scale. I'm just going to reset this graph. The scale has four options, linear, log log, semi log X and semi log Y. Now, if you look at the graph, you will see that there is a grid of 16 squares in the back of the graph. And you will notice that they are actually squares. So this is a linear graph. If we go to log log x, y, both the x axis and the y axis have now been scaled logarithmically, which means that our shadow tones take up more area within the graph than our highlight tones. Look at the size of that top right square compared with this bottom left square. So both the x-axis and the y-axis are now logarithmic. From that, you should be able to work out what the last two modes do. The next one is semi-log x. And as you can see, the y-axis is still linear, but the x-axis is logarithmic. And the last option is the opposite of that. The x-axis is purely linear, and the y-axis is logarithmic. So what these three log modes are useful for, the log-log and the two semi-log modes, is for giving you finer control over placement of nodes in your shadow areas. Now, you're probably looking at that graph and thinking, well, it'd be great if I could expand the deep shadows area even further. Well, guess what? You can. That's what this base of the logarithm slider is for. As you increase that, we rescale the logarithmic axis. Now, because I'm in semi-log Y, it's only rescaling the Y axis. If I go to semi-log X, it's rescaled the X axis. And if I go to log log, it's rescaled both. So now I've got the ability to really ramp that up and have super, super fine control over where I place my nodes in the deep shadows. That's a really cool function. I love that. Don't use it all the time, but I do love it. Alrighty, that 
is pretty much going to do it for the tone curve module. Uh, I hope this has been useful, and uh, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, please sing out in the comments down below, and I will catch you in the next one.